Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to introduce you to the men who make that music at Orchestra Hall. You'll also get to hear an informal and easy-to-understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities and what's more. You, listening right now, have an opportunity to win two main floor tickets for a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And today, let's turn to the pages in your symphony scrapbook that tell about that somewhat uh, unfamiliar instrument, the viola. And we have with us Mr. Rocco Germano, member of the viola section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Germano, I'm sure our listeners would like to have you identify the selection that you played at the beginning of the program and uh, perhaps play some more from that composition. Uh, yes, this is the uh, part of the elegy from the String Serenade by Tchaikovsky. Although you've been with the orchestra, let's see, this is your fourth season, isn't it? My fourth year, yes. Uh, This is your first appearance on uh, uh, this series of programs. And so I think it will uh, uh, be interesting to our listeners to have you tell a little bit about your background, uh, your early training, uh, about your previous orchestral experience before uh, joining the Chicago Symphony. Yes. Well, uh, I was born in Italy, and uh, I came here at the age of eight and began studying the violin when I was twelve and a half, a little bit late in life, I think. And I attended Notre Dame University uh, for two and a half years. I spent three years in the Army, which I, in which I did uh, intelligence work. I was a dental technician, and I also was in special service and uh, played with many traveling shows. And I was in a pit orchestra with such men as Mickey Rooney and... Uh, other Hollywood and Broadway personalities. And uh, uh, while I was in the surface, I also conducted a musical in Wiesbaden, Germany, and I had a lot of fun doing it. I attended Chicago Musical College after uh, my discharge, and I received my bachelor's and my master's degrees, and I studied with uh, Paul Stasevich and uh, Milton Preece. Uh, did you have any orchestral experience before, uh, I mean, outside of the Army? Uh, yes, I, I played in Grand Park Orchestra, and I was assistant principal down in New Orleans for a year. Well, we're glad to have you with us. Now, I, in uh, introducing this uh, program, I said something about the viola being an unfamiliar uh, instrument. Uh, certainly it is not, uh, doesn't uh, share, say, in popular favor the violin or the uh, uh, cello. And I think even among uh, a large number of professional uh, uh, musicians, it's not rated uh, very highly. Is is that partly because there's not much literature for the uh, viola? Well, no, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I disagree with, with you, of course. <laughs> but uh, there is much, much literature for the instrument. Um, well, let's start with the uh, uh, with Berlioz, Herald in Italy. Uh, that's undoubtedly the most famous piece of music uh, prior to the century. And uh, it's interesting to note uh, Cecil Forsyth in his book on orchestration. Uh, he states that uh, to hear this monumentally dull piece of music is quite enough to put the listener off the viola for the rest of his life. Well, fortunately, the statement has not been taken too seriously for uh, today. It's one of Berlioz's most popular works. And today, of course, we look at it not as a concerto, but as a symphony with viola obbligato, in which the viola is used mostly for coloring. And there have been many other uh, composers during the last 50 years or so who have written very important works for the viola. And uh, it's unfortunate we don't hear these works perform more frequently. To name a few of these composers, there's Paul Hindemith, Benjamin Dale, Yorf Bowen, Sir Sir Arnold Bax, Gordon Jacob, Granville Bontoc, Vaughn Williams, Block, Walton, Quincy Porter, Tibor Surley, and Bartok, and many others. And uh, you will notice that many of these are English. And uh, 
It's also interesting to note that uh, the two greatest violists of the century, Lionel Curtis and uh, William Primrose, are English, and uh, it shows you what uh, an important uh, contribution they made to the literature, actually. Well, I'd like to throw in, you uh, uh, talked about uh, Berlioz in answering my question. Wasn't it Berlioz who uh, said that the uh, viola has long been... Uh, uh, misappreciated or the most uh, misappreciated of all the mus uh, orchestral instruments? Uh, he probably Some did. Are, perhaps uh, that's why he wrote Harold Nitley to uh, bring it to the fore yes. and show it. Well, you know, he was a great colorist and used different sections of the orchestra for coloring, and in the uh, Harold and Nitley, I think he uses that mainly for that purpose, for coloring. Well, among uh, those uh, you mentioned, is there any uh, one composer whose uh, work you'd like to use in illustration of the qualities of the viola? Uh, yes, I like to play... Uh, uh, the fantasy uh, by Paul Hindemith from his sonata, uh, Opus 11, number 4. Uh, one question I always ask the older players when they appear on this program because I like to get their dander up a little bit. I'll preface my question with um, a statement I saw the other day in an article in which a viola player was defending his instrument. and He said that um, a violist needs um, a greater amount of sensitivity uh, than uh, most musicians uh, because... Um, Instead of being able to show off um, in brilliant passages, I think he was referring to, say, the violins or the cellos, he has to bring out the specific sound and color quality of the instrument. Uh, with that to shoot at, I'll say to you, well, now, what do you think of the statement that you so often hear that a violist is nothing more or less than a broken-down violinist or a disgruntled violinist or a frustrated violinist? Oh, well, first let me say that I agree with you on the, this violist on the first statement, that uh, uh, a violist tries to bring out the musical qualities. Uh, for an example, uh, let me ask you this. You wouldn't consider Stock or Manteau or another one, Milton Kadams, a broken-down violist, just because they, be, you know, these men became great conductors. I think. Oh, well, understand that what I said was in quotation marks. Yes, well, <laughs> even so. Uh, 
Well, I just think that uh, I don't agree with the deal that they're broken down fiddle players, naturally. I uh, think that one finds the field or the instrument he's most interested in and explores it to the best of his ability. And today, uh, you know, one can't retire from the violin section of the orchestra and join the viola section because the instrument is too demanding and uh, skill is gained only after years of diligent studying. Well, I think the same writer I quoted a few minutes ago said a viola player is um, born, not made. Mm, probably true. Uh, yes, I, I, I believe that certain people are more sympathetic towards the instrument. Uh, uh, for example, you wouldn't expect a person who uh, can't stand high penetrating pitch to become a fine violinist. And also, you wouldn't expect a, a man who uh, can't stand the lower register to become a good bass player. And, and I think this is something that should be given very careful consideration in training students to become instrumentalists. I've known of several cases of, of students who haven't done too well on the violin and it's changed to the viola, and uh, immediately their attitude changed and they had progressed much faster. Well, how did you happen to become a viola player? Well, when I was in college, there was nobody around to play viola in chamber music or orchestra, so I volunteered. After three years in the Army, I volunteered. <laughs> but uh, I haven't been sorry. I found that uh, I spent much more and more time on the instrument, and uh, I liked it. So I changed, and I'm very happy with it. And in other words, uh, would you, do you think it's a, it's a greater challenge than, uh, say, the violin or the cello, which are better known? Well, I think any string instrument is a challenge. In other words, I you never know. really can uh, can conquer the instrument. Mm -hmm. If you had to start all over again, would you uh, start with the uh, viola? Uh, I probably would, yes. Uh -huh. I haven't given it too much consideration, but uh, I think it's a good idea because many young students today are starting on the viola, and uh, they get a better perspective of the instrument, the sound, and so forth. Well, fine. Uh, thanks ever so much, uh, much, Mr. Uh, Germano, for this uh, very interesting uh, program which you've given us. And uh, now I'd like to uh, send a pair of tickets for a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in Orchestra Hall to Dr. F. K. Kruger of Valparaiso University at Valparaiso, Indiana, for his anecdote, which we're putting in our scrapbook at this time. He said that Max Rager was not only a great composer, but also an excellent pianist, and frequently he appeared in concerts as a performer on the piano. And thus, at one time, he played the piano part in Schubert's Opus 114, the so-called Ferellen or Trout Quintet. After the performance, an enthusiastic female admirer sent him a box of excellent trout. Uh, Mr. Rager acknowledged the receipt of the present with thanks and added, May I also remind you, my dear lady, that next week I'm going to take part in the playing of Joseph Haydn's so-called oxen menuet, that is, the ox menuet. And thanks to Dr. Kruger for his interesting anecdote.